let's talk about kind of more broadly a paper you wrote. How long has it been? Two years? Well, we probably wrote it longer than two years ago. I think it came out at the end of 2021. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's fairly recent. You're talking about, the, like science, I, about yeah, the science paper. Yeah, yeah, and I'd read it before, it was no, so I've Maybe lost November track. 2021 All right, so, or so. so talk about the impetus for that paper, which was I thought was a great paper, and we should discuss it in, in yeah, some detail. Yeah, so, um, so I, I was asked by one of the editors at, at Science to write a review, I think on M, mTOR, actually. And, and I was like, well, lots of people have written reviews on mTOR. I've been thinking a lot about you know caloric restriction, um, and particularly other nutritional strategies that, that people have been studying in the field, um, like ketogenic diet, protein restriction, time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. Um, and, you know, what do we actually know about those diets and, and their effects on aging, right? Because I was of the, before I started to really dive into it, and, and this isn't something that my lab researches directly. So we've <clears throat> previously done work on caloric restriction in, in, in invertebrates and C. elegans, but we never really have done a lot of dietary interventions in, in mice. And so, you know, before I kind of dove into the literature, I had this impression, you know, that all of these diets were similar in some ways and had maybe comparable effects on lifespan. At least that's the way it gets portrayed if you read some of these reviews. And I don't even like to call them reviews because I don't think, honestly, much of what gets into the literature as review articles are actually reviews. It's more one person's opinion piece on their specific thing that they study, which is unfortunate. But if you read most of the reviews on caloric restriction and other dietary interventions, they're very one-sided. And they, 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 they usually have phrases like, you know, fasting is known to have all of these fantastic benefits and, you know, slows aging in all, every place where it's been looked at. And you can see that for all these different dietary strategies. So, so I, I proposed to the editor that, you know, maybe we should do a critical review of this space and think about what do we know? What do we don't know? Are they equivalent? And to the extent possible, can we gain any insights into whether or not these um, nutritional strategies, that whether there's evidence that they have an impact on the aging process in people? So that's kind of where we started. And I knew it was an ambitious thing to tackle when I said it. And I'm not sure I really appreciated exactly how challenging that was going to be, because it's a huge area um, of literature um, and it turns out, maybe not shockingly, that there are many more questions than there are answers when you really dive into it. Um, so we really just started. So what was your process? Yeah. So we really just start. The first step was, and I should say, I had a fa fantastic set of um, co-authors, all you know, really great early career scientists who who really helped me with this and did a lot of the, the legwork. Um, I just want to mention them by name, please do. I want, so so Alessandro Bito, who was a postdoc with me, um, uh, Mitchell Lee, who was a former graduate student with me, and Crystal Hill, who's at the Pennington Biomedical Research uh, Institute, and she works on FGF. 21 and protein restriction. So those three were co-authors on this paper with me, all just, just really fantastic early career scientists. So, so we started by um, asking ourselves, okay, what are the different popular dietary interventions that people have claimed have an effect on aging? And we, we came up with, I don't know, six or seven. Um, and they were the, the ones I've already mentioned. So there's true caloric restriction, which is pretty straightforward. That, you know, really just means limiting the overall caloric mm -hmm. intake that an animal gets, you know, by somewhere between 20 towards the low end and up the, the, the most I've ever seen is 65% of calories. And you were doing this in animals and humans or were you were trying? We started, we were mostly focusing on mice. We, we yeah. narrowed it pretty quickly when we realized the scope of what, <laughs> what we had undertaken. So we could have tried to do it in, you know, fruit flies and yeah. worms and all that stuff. We said, let's start with mice, see what's known. And then try to look into humans and ask, are there parallels, yep. right? Okay. So caloric restriction, pretty straightforward. We actually don't go very deep into caloric restriction because that, that literature is huge. And other people I think have done a pretty good job of, of reviewing true caloric restriction. Um, but there are some points there that we probably want to touch on that are important. And then there are variants of caloric restriction, which include um, uh, intermittent fasting, uh, uh, time-restricted feeding, um, so how I've, did you differentiate those two? Right. I, I have a definition, but I want to make sure yours is right. clear. So in mice, um, I think, well, so first of all, the first different, differentiator we need to put across all of these things is, uh, is it isocaloric or is it 
a flavor of caloric restriction. Because it turns out, I would say the vast majority of studies in mice of all of the things that we're going to talk about are flavors of caloric restriction. And what I mean by that is the, the experimental group ate less calories than the Right. So it's time-restricted feeding, but it's really caloric restriction in a narrower window. Intermittent caloric restriction, yep. maybe is the way you want to think of it. Yep. And there's actually some nuance there that, that, uh, that we can get to. But um, right. So, so how am I differentiating between time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting? So I, in a, I would say, to, to my view, the easiest differentiator is time-restricted feeding is limiting the number of hours in any 24-hour period mm -hmm. that the animal or person eats, right? And yep. there are obviously, you're, you're aware of this, there are flavors of time-restricted feeding in people where the window, you know, can be anywhere from 12 to 6, sometimes even more extreme than that, right? But you limit the hours per day that the animal or the person eats. Um, intermittent fasting, I would put in a 24-hour or more fast, yep. right? I think that's a... It, that's a reasonable that, that, definition. That's actually the definition I use, basically. Okay. And, and, yeah. An yeah. intermittent fast is a fast that occurs at a frequency of greater than once a day. Right, exactly. Yeah. The other thing I would say, though, is, is the time-restricted feeding gets even more complicated than that because there's evidence that it's not only about how big the window is, but where in the day the window is. And that's actually one of the things that that you know came out of our, our um, review of the literature is there is this, there is this clear connection between how much we eat and when we eat that ties into circadian rhythms. And that circadian biology, even since this review came out, there have been papers that have come out that, that reemphasize the importance of when we eat and what we eat. I don't think it's either. I think it's both. Um, uh, that suggests that, that that's probably going to be um, significant in terms of the, the, the consequences of the long-term health effects. All right. I'm hoping I'm going to remember to come back to that, but okay. let's keep going. Okay. So then there's uh, what people call fasting mimicking diets, which are diets that have been um, engineered to some extent to induce the same metabolic changes as caloric restriction, usually very low sugar, relatively low protein, high fat, but also very low calorie. So that clearly goes in the bucket of a flavor of caloric restriction. There's ketogenic diets is, is another one. Um, uh, and then there's protein restriction. I think that's the, I so think that's isocaloric the group we're protein restriction. Well, both. So again, okay. you really have to look, you have to take each paper one by one mm -hmm. and figure out, is it isocaloric or isn't it? And that's in some cases just not simply not possible because the data is just not there, but, but you have to look closely. So there are examples of both. I guess one way to think about it is, is it ad lib or not, is one way to sort of think about it. In other words, an ad lib ketogenic diet might end up restricting energy, yep. but non-deliberately. That's one way to think about it. But I don't, I don't know that that answers the question of whether the benefit comes no, it from doesn't. caloric restriction. Oh, it, it or not, right? So that's doesn't. a complication. Yep. But I agree with you. That yep. is, it, it, it's, it's different. And, you know, we don't think about this much in, in mice, but certainly in people, it's true. If you are not ad lib, there are psychological consequences to not eating when you want, to being hungry all the time. Good, bad, indifferent, but there are those are those have those those have biological consequences as well, right? Yep. So they are different, absolutely. Mm -hmm.